right, so now we move on to William Morris and the Arts and Crafts Movement. You want to kind of keep in your head this is England now, or in England, um, and see these shifts in space and time that are going on. As we continue to work the 1890s, there's so much going on in this time period. And arts and Crafts, again, it's an early movement, like Ray Dahl, but um, Arts and Crafts is still going on in that 1890s period, so 1890s or 1880s would be correct. Uh, the person that we are focusing on for that movement is William Morris, because he is their sort of leading spokesman of the movement. He is working in collaboration with another artist in this tapestry. It's not important that you know that other artist's name. Um, he's a Victorian painter that we didn't really develop a background for, so I don't expect you to know his name. But what we have is an artist interested in designing fabric designs, working on tapestries, this is very different from the academy, which seems to be all about painting or sculpture, and with a real hierarchy of what types of paintings are most important, like mythological scenes. Um, so what we've got here is uh, William Morris as kind of the uh, Martha Stewart of this age, sort of designing a kind of plan for what uh, a design for a good life would be. So the aesthetic of arts and crafts is very geared toward a kind of social reform way of life. So a way of restoring a certain kind of quality to life, right? Um, and they feel very strongly that design plays a very important role. Now we're gonna see design emerge at this moment. They don't maybe have the term graphic design, but design is starting to emerge in so many ways, through posters, through entertainment kind of, designs, you know, we're, the modern world is starting to erupt. This doesn't look that modern because our arts and ideas people feel in this new industrial world, quality design is threatened. It's threatened. So there is a sense of a rage against the machine on the part of our arts and um, crafts people. They feel you need to go back go back in time, which is why they give us a mythological goddess, Pomona, the goddess of spring trees and other. Um, they feel they have to go back to the medieval manuscript uh, with its kind of illuminated manuscript and its linear flow. Um, so they, they have a sense of going historical and rejecting the modern world of machines and, um, and kind of what they see as poorly crafted, machine-made, popular culture goods. So it's a move against popular culture. Uh, so they do that to give us a kind of quality of design. But what they do embrace is a stylized flower. And that means a flower, a symbol of nature, which is getting redefined as linear flow. Now, when you redesign the flower's linear flow, you're abstracting what you mean by nature. It's no longer necessarily a particular kind of flower, but it's pushing more toward line for line's sake. And as you do that, you're abstracting. So this is yet another way to abstract. Arts and crafts is not abstracting through the psyche. Arts and crafts is abstracting through form, through style through thinking of the flower as this kind of linear flow. And that's a new definition of nature as something constantly sh changing and um, metamorphosizing. So we see that starting to happen here. Nature's becoming more artifice, more like an ornament um, in this work. And there is a lot of linear flow. You certainly see it in um, the design of the tapestry that he works on here. The arts and crafts name refers to the fact that they believe every artist should be, must be, a good craftsperson. Without craft, you shouldn't call yourself an artist. And every good craftsperson should think of themselves as an artist. So for them, there's no definition of the fine arts versus the crafts. They see these things as in, intrinsically intertwined. Okay, so that's a part of it. And they do believe very much in a kind of ethical reform that the world, this modern world, needs, artists need to think about what is good, what is um, the moral of the story, what will bring a kind of, of a good ethical standard to their art. 
Now, at the same time in the 1890s, you've got someone like Beardsley, I'll be Beard, or, um, Beardsley in uh, working also in, um, in England. And he is not interested in a morality of art. Does not believe there is such a thing as moral styles and immoral styles. Um, he instead is interested in a kind of stylized flower that here is made out of the, the blood that drips down from the severed head of John the Baptist held by Salome, the femme fatale. So we've got a very different kind of story going on here. And um, you could say it is a kind of decadent stylized flower. So you would call his movement, uh, fin de siècle, this means end of the century decadence. Or you could kind of relate what he's doing with all of the curvilinear, linear rhythms here as being close to Art Nouveau. Now, what are the differences between Art Nouveau and Arts and Crafts? They all have linear rhythm, right? Linear flow. Uh, arts and Crafts is against the machine. Art Nouveau works with new modern inventions, new modern technologies. Uh, and they, too, will embrace the stylized flower. So you see a lot of people clustering around the same motif, but with different reasons. Certainly our decadence, uh, our movement of decadence, and basically that's a movement that believes in art for art's sake. Art for art's sake. You do not have to tell a moral. The artist's only necessity is that they must pursue beauty. And beauty for our so-called decadent artists usually is an intricate, complicated, rare of five beauty, art for art's sake. Um, and that too, if you push it far enough, when the flower becomes a kind of linear flow, you're pushing more and more toward abstraction through formal shifts of style. So you just need to know that they're not interested in those moral standards. The only thing you must pursue is beauty. There is no such thing as an immoral style. So we see that starting to happen with Beardsley, great example of the femme fatale coming back. Uh, he did a lot of illustrations for Oscar Wilde, um, and so their works of art were sometimes banned and censored as well. Then we went to France, we went back to France to look at the work of the Mousse Tech, which you could also label as part of this end of the century decadent movement um, or a kind of art nouveau celebration of the modern world. While I was in Dallas last weekend, actually one week ago, right now. Right now in the afternoon, I was at the Dallas Museum of Art, and they were having a huge show on posters uh, from Paris in this time period, and it was wonderful. You not only got to see this poster uh, that they had at the show, but they had uh, a lot of other works by toulouse lautrec and um, some of the other artists who had just preceded him, and you could see what was so new and different about toulouse lautrec And what became so clear that I, and next time I teach it, I'm going to teach it differently. <laughs> I'm going to teach a little differently and emphasize some things that I didn't push quite enough because when I saw this show, you guys say, my God, this is the birth of modern entertainment advertising. They're all trying to get you to come to these clubs where they're advertising different products. And uh, just beforehand, they were using kind of typical scenes in a, in a, with one point perspective that we're all kind of cluttered and detailed. Toulouse Lautrec just sweeps that and really brings <coughs> all the energy just to the surface. He thinks in terms of two-dimensional poster design. He revolutionized the poster in the process. He made it something really modern. He brought um, into it something that had much more, less sweetness, much more kind of edginess to the place. Uh, so he gave it a lot of new character. Uh, and. Um, it was really quite uh, amazing to see that whole sort of industry come to life. Uh, always using woman to sell a product <laughs> or a place. Here they're selling the Moulin Rouge. This is his painting of it. This is his poster. We looked at a lot of toulouse lautrec I decided I'm just going to focus in on the poster and the painting. Um, so you can really work him because this is such an amazing painting and such an amazing poster. Sharpening starting to come in with the way the space plunges down toward us instead of going back gradually into depth. Startling composition, where we have this, this space 
with green and red. Look at the artifice. Look at the artificial kind of qualities. Look at how far we are from natural light. Or what they said in Impressionism, plein air, open air, fresh, fresh air. This is the artificial light of gas lamps or the beginnings of new electricity. Um, it is the ability to light up the night. So some of the terminology I gave for you, because he's really interesting stylistically and in terms of subject, what he's introducing. Um, these are pictures from um, the demi-monde. Sorry, the thing in the French there. The demi-monde, the half-lit world of the night. So this idea of working with modern technology that allows you to illuminate the darkness gives you clubs and establishments that you can go to at night uh, because we're not living just by candlelight anymore. It uh, gives you a new kind of garish quality, the artificiality of the place. And we know how he pushes this to the idea of one's identity, that one should craft an identity for the self um, by turning oneself into a work of art, live your life like a work of art. So it's the sense of pushing it and giving style to one's life. This is getting to abstraction through style, through style and form. So the key thing here was to be an individual. And he ought to know because born into the aristocracy, he was just not born like any of the others. Short with even shorter legs. Um, a big lisp and a nose big enough for two faces, as his friends said. Um, Toulouse Lautrec stood out in the crowd, even though he was so short. And so he has a really amazing message about otherness to give. You know, of seeing the world from the point of view of the other, seeing the world from the from elbow's height, seeing the world from a skewed, unusual angle, from something very individualistic. And I think he celebrates that when he pushes character to caricature. You know, it's kind of an art of exaggeration. It's an art that pushes style and pushes it straight to the surface, brings it straight to the surface plane. You really see that in the two-dimensional quality of his posters, the graphic quality. He cuts off deep depth by making this black silhouette so our eyes don't go past that into depth. It keeps us on the surface where two-dimensional letters tell us what's going on. So that is a way of making the image and the letters work together. He gives us abstract shapes to indicate the modern world of lights, electric lights or gas lamps here. Um, information and image work together. Words become visual. Words become images. By the font style he uses, everything is stylized, including his name, brought to the surface. This whole idea of creating an art of the demi monde and an art of this new type of leisure establishment, nightclubs, points to the changing world of the Industrial Revolution. That we don't just have aristocrats and peasants who work the land. What we have now is the industrial world has made a bourgeoisie, a middle class. We have middle class hangouts. We have a whole new class system. Um, and we have a whole new uh, a place to hang out that is not just a cafe in the open air. So a lot is uh, starting to shift. And he's one of the first people that introduces the face as a mask. And that mask kind of doubles the face, destabilizes identity. Identities are shifting. But he sees this as exciting because this is the chance to construct your own identity, to build your own style, not just to uh, be defined by um, your wealth or lack of. You know, it's the belief like, hey, maybe it won't be just a 1%, 47% world. <laughs> maybe it really will be this middle class. Um, so what we see here is his, his incredible expressive line to the clubs is a lot about 